The theme of the show today is improvise, and we got it off to a good start. You had an urgent phone call, and uh, that, that kept you busy right up until start time. So all the prep work that we were going to do in the 15 minutes before the show all went out the window, which is perfect because the theme of the show is improvise. Totally. Let's improvise. Talk to me. It's been a long, long time since we were working in Hong Kong together. Give me, give me just a brief rundown of your career in this crazy business. Everybody knows what I've done, uh, but I would, I'm sure they would love to hear about all the cool stuff that you've done. Um, yeah, well, I got 30 years in. I think I, my first agency was Foster Advertising, which is one of the larger uh, Canadian companies back in the day. Uh, that was in 1988. Shit, oh, really? I'll update my bio. It's, uh, yeah, it's 30 years in the biz. Um, I was there for... Uh, well, then I went to JWT, uh, and then I went to SMW, my favorite agency. I was there for a year and a half, and I always said I'd buy a plane ticket before I bought a car. So once I had my student loans paid off, I I went over to Hong Kong. Not didn't know I was going to meet you, but uh, yeah, I ended up there for a while, and then uh, ended up and went to Bangkok, and then came back to Canada and got a really good job at Ambrose Car, like as a head writer on Acura, and I just really had the travel bug by then, so. Shortly thereafter, I went to Australia and New Zealand, uh, did some freelance over there. Not too much, did a lot of traveling, and then came back and, uh, yeah, just kept going with the freelance life and pretty much a uh, career freelancer, I guess. Like, I've, I have slowed down at times in some places, but, um, uh, yeah, just uh, set it up to kind of do it in a little different way. And uh, used to be a euphemism for you couldn't find a job was to say you're freelance now, but uh, I, I just did it by choice. and. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was, it's been, it went fast. It was 30. You know, it, it, it's funny, um, when, when people talk to me about working in Asia, I always say the big thing about working in different countries is that you got to see if your ideas can work in different cultures. And the, the lesson that I always learned was you had to simplify it down to basic human stuff, right? There's no room for wordplay in Hong Kong because they don't think like we think. They don't, they don't, they don't, they don't, they think. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm curious about, about, you know, funny stories about that kind of stuff. I mean, I've had plenty of funny stories that I've shared where I, I was a 22-year-old uh, white guy working in Hong Kong selling Lancome to 55-year-old Chinese women. And that, there, you know, hilarity ensues yeah. because you don't think like a 55-year-old Chinese lady. Yeah. I, I'm curious about, you know, any sort of adventures or misadventures you had, particularly in Hong Kong, where you learned to reduce your message down to its simplest. Uh, yeah, it's funny when I got to, cause I, I, I first got a job, I really wanted to go to Singapore and you know, like there was all the great shops and Neil French and Neil uh, French. Yeah. Ball partnership and, uh, you know, doing some great stuff. And I was in touch with John Kiriako who I knew from, uh, JWT Toronto. So he was very helpful. He actually offered me a job in Singapore, but by then I had taken a job at a small agency. Um, they work Saturdays. I don't know if you worked anywhere in Hong Kong, but that, that was kind of a thing with a lot of agencies was to work on a Saturday, like a half day Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I got into DDB after that, shortly after that. And all the accounts they put me on, it was all these sartor sartorial references like the, you know, like uh, custom fitting your financial stuff for banks and custom fitting your phone, your telecom stuff. And everything was all, all this stuff analogy to a custom suits and my this is probably the best you're ever going to see me dress mark even on my, my my wedding day like i i'm like i'm not the guy to be writing fashion copy you know to tie it into banking like i really don't don't have that uh, that skill set and yeah i slowly had to i had to work my way through that but uh yeah you're right it's um you gotta you can't lean too much into the analogies or the terms of phrases that you would in a, in a, in an English market. Um, and that, and tonally too, like, uh, uh when I was at McCann in uh, Bangkok, uh, I was just traveling through, I met, you know, met some of the people at McCann and they invited me on and I ended up staying. It was going to be a couple of weeks. I stayed a few months and, um, but one of the accounts was for the big one they got me in for was the, the uh, Siam commercial bank. And they were hosting the IMF conference, which was going to be in Bangkok that coming year. And um, so I just like really got into the culture and I you know, 
just reading up on Thailand and, and found out that, you know, they'd been at war with Burma for so many years. And uh, up in northern Thailand, they still do those exercises where they, they'll have battles on the fields with the elephants and they're like armored elephants. And they got the little uh, canopy carriage on top with the spears and there'd be a guy that would hand the spears to the, 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 the rider of the elephant. And they had these big, and they re recreate these big battles much like we would at uh, old Fort Henry or whatever they have. So there's some amazing photos, you can Google it, uh, amazing photos of, of elephants going into battle against the, uh, you know, and the Thai and the Burmese were big fights. So to me, it was a, a no brainer. We had the back cover of the World Bank Conference uh, program guide. And I had this really menacing shot of, of these attacking elephants. And the headline said, uh, 350 years ago, uh, the Thais use other means to welcome foreign investors. <laughs> and it, yeah, I loved it. My boss is from Atlanta. He loved it. Uh, we managed to get it to client a couple times, but they're like, that's one where that's just not Thai. It's just not their tone. They don't like that aggression. They don't like, it's just, I came so close to selling it a few times. I remember kind of flailing my, literally falling over a, like this large ottoman in a conference room because I, yeah, it was close and then they'd pull off and they're like, yeah, we have to, you can keep the headline, but we're getting rid of that visual. So Now just, talk to me, talk to me about um, improvising. You know, uh, a lot of the people that, uh, that are in this group are people who used to work for big corporations. That's why I thought it'd be really, really cool having you on board because they were until a very short time ago working for big, comfortable organizations and now they're on your own. So you are a lifelong entrepreneur. You have gone from culture to culture, always throwing yourself headfirst into a place where you're writing headlines about fighting elephants. Couldn't picture yourself in that situation, I'm sure. But, you know, you're always finding yourself in new and different situations. Advice to people who are suddenly finding themselves in a situation like that and have to build their own brand up. Any thoughts on that? Um, yeah. Uh... I think it's just a, assessing what you have, what's in front of you, and then what to do with it. What's a, you know, like from uh, the Ron Howard film where they, you know, when the, the, the moon mission, is it Apollo? Mm -hmm. Apollo 13, yeah, yeah. The Fixing the moon capsule with duct tape. Here's what you, they have up there. You got to make, turn this into something. And I get excited at that. Like when, I think, you know, a lot of creative people, they get excited by being put into a box and then, and the box being like, here are your resources or here's your media budget or here's your where well, you don't have a lot to go on um even getting into the business i was did a little thinking about it and getting into the business was like that like i i went to uh i i got a degree from uh uh from uh, carlton university in mass communication i tried to get an advertising no you know didn't have anything didn't have a book I managed to get into the program uh, at George Brown in Toronto to do an applied arts, pro like a, a commercial art program. But it required me to have 20 insurable weeks earnings in order to get to the program so I could actually go to Toronto and be paid $165 a week. And then uh, I was working at Kraft Cheese and they laid me off and I had like 16 weeks earnings. I needed four more weeks and the program was starting in about seven or eight weeks. If I didn't get those insurable weeks earnings, I, I was pooched. I, I would not get into the program. Um, and then I, I, I'd already picked up some odd jobs just, you know, kind of under the table. And it's like, so the, the insurable weeks ended. And then somebody said, well, you know, you, you basically got to get a job in the next. So I couldn't find anything. I was applying everywhere. And I said, fuck it. I'm getting odd jobs, you know, doing handyman work. So I, I created a company. I went to, through all the channels and the government and made my own company and I got my you know, sister on it and I, I paid my CPP and I paid my uh, UI back in the day, like the EI. And I basically had to create a company so I could get about three more weeks of insurable earnings in order to get into the, the art program in Toronto. And it was just like that. It was just a hustle with what you had in front of you. And like, I don't know if that's uh, what you're looking for, but yeah. Um, well, I, I think that there's, I, I just got off the phone with another uh, person who runs a company that does content for hotels. So basically they do beautiful photography, drone video, all that kind of stuff. Of course, that business hasn't been doing so well. And so what he's, they've been moving into is a whole bunch of stuff that is based on culture, company culture. So because as companies grow apart, they have to have some glue that pulls them all together. And that is culture. And how do you express it if you can't all talk? 
you put videos out. And so, you know, he said it's incredible because it's, it's the constraint, you know, it's the, cons the more constraints you put on yourself, the more creative you're forced to get. And when you get creative, then you come up with really, really cool stuff. You know, I, I remember, yeah, being, um, uh, uh, working, working in Hong Kong where the, you know, the language was English kinda, but you're always on the outside. You're always, you're always scrambling. Uh, you always feel like you're getting charged double and you're not getting half the message. Um, it forces you to get really, really creative and, uh, working with, so we had three people on our team. We had a, an English writer, me, my art director, and then a Chinese writer. And we used to struggle all the time because all the good ideas that we had would either be Chinese ideas or English ideas. And you had to come up with stuff that was uh, yeah. so fundamental that it would work all over. And that was where the good stuff came out. So I think that's a good lesson too. If people are going, well, I can't make it because, you know, uh, my company, there's too much competition or there is, you know, I, I can't do my very specialized job. I have to do more general stuff. Uh, but all that kind of stuff is, is they're all good constraints. Yeah. I mean, just hearing you though, I think sometimes uh, clients will, they create their own constraints. They got a mindset in their head, like of how something should be. Um, like as early on, I probably had a two or three years in the business and I was living, uh, I was living on young street at the time and there's a futon guy opened up across the street. Yeah, uh, Michael's Futon Manufacturer was the name of the company, and and I I needed a place to sleep. I went in, and this this guy was so he was a published poet from Romania, and he just so loved this product. Like he he's showing me like the the top thing was triple stitched with this really strong cotton, and he's showing me like the thickness of the cotton that he was using versus other ones. And then he pulled out this like this little mini cricket bat, and he starts beating the snot out of this uh, of this futon, and then he's like flexing it and showing me how it's it basically giving me product demo after and I was so I'm like yeah I'll take one <laughs> it's like and I slept on it. it was amazing I came back to him being the ad nerd and the young you know rookie uh, like a junior I'm like I'd like to do some ads for you and he couldn't understand so then I I brought him a one show book to show him like you know just to be transparent I'm like look I'm trying to build my portfolio I'd like you know these are the kind of ads i I'd like to do and I'd, these kind of books. And he's like, no one's gonna, my customers won't look at this book. I'm like, no, your, your customers will never see, this is for me. I'm just gonna try to help you with, with your business. And, uh, he's, and he's, then he started getting interested and we did, uh, I got uh, my buddy Frank uh, Lepre, I think you might know yeah. him. But, uh, we did some TV for him, very low budget TV. I think we all in, it was about 500 bucks and it was all like, supers and type and it basically was like the phonetic sound of snoring and you just keep seeing all these different mm -hmm. and it would, like you'd hear the sound but you'd see the phonetic spelling of that those, those, those gurgles from the night and your snore sounds uh and then it a bunch of those came up and then you it said don't take our word for it sleep on it yeah and it's michael's fluton manufacturer and the snoring continues and we ran them late at night uh, the idea being you know, if you're up at two in the morning, you know, you're probably not sleeping that well. And we still had, and we had other spots like you're still up. You know, have you tried counting sheep? Have you tried warm milk? Maybe you just need a new bed. And it's Michael's futon. And they were very simple. And he, he liked those. And then he's like, okay, so this is back to what you're saying. He's like, I want to do, I want to do a brochure. And like a brochure, why would, and he goes, well, I'm a manufacturer. I don't want to be, I don't want to be a retail guy. I just, I needed a storefront to move some product to get some money, but I really, and then he brought me out to his warehouse out in Aurora. And I'm like, yeah, this, and it was amazing. And he's making all this stuff because I want to be a manufacturer. And I'm like, so you, I'm like, well, okay. So what's your capacity and what do you, and then he's, he said, this is where, yeah, people don't say, he says, I need one customer. And he started talking about Idomo and some of these other companies. He says, I just need one of those. I'm like, so why would you? And back in the day, you know, like, uh, color printing was not cheap. He's, I'm like, why would you spend thousands on that when you got your best sales thing is right in front of you. You, 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 you get so passionate talking about your futon. Why don't you just send your futon? He's wet. So, so, so it was like two phone calls. I found out the head buyer for this company. Uh, and then we, 
we got him to donate a futon and we folded it in half, which is not an easy thing to do. They're so rigid. And then we got him to make a case, like a cotton case with a zipper on it. And then silk screened on the top, it said, you're about to make the biggest purchasing decision of your life. And then when you unzip it, the whole thing would just snap open. And then there was another silk screen cotton piece on top of it. It said, sleep on it. And it's like Michael's futon manufacturer. He got a phone call that day because, you know, this thing was sent to that guy's office. It cost him a futon and maybe 50 bucks worth of cotton to make the thing and the silk screen. And, and uh, yeah, they, they got into a conversation and he actually couldn't fill the order that they wanted. But the guy wanted to buy his stuff, but it did the job, but it didn't work out in the end. But that's the kind of thing where I think people think it has to be this way when you can really, you know, for not a lot of money, you can go over here with a message. Well, I, yeah, I think, and also, I think if you set yourself the constraint saying that I got zero dollars or as close to zero as possible, there's also an important thing. I think that a lot of people are still confused by the old thing, who you sell into while we're mass. That yeah. means you have to sell to everybody. They're all over the map. That means you have to shave all the good bits off to make it as mass market as possible. And suddenly you're stuck with a Pop-Tarts ad. Totally. And it's awful. And if you say, I don't want everybody, I want one person. And, you know, for entrepreneurs, I think especially people who are in B2B, they go, we got to sell to everybody. No, you don't. You got to sell to one guy. Exactly. And if you could do one good thing and he buys your stuff or she buys your stuff and then you do it again and again yeah. and again, um, you know, I, and you can do that. It was, it's funny because I, I told the story here a while ago about this creative director from Fallon McElligot. Who, who I knew and he helped his son-in-law and the son-in-law made pet treats. So it wasn't even a, it wasn't a B to, it wasn't a B to B thing. It was a brand to consumer, but he wanted to make uh, this pet food as or these pet snacks as popular as possible. So they came up with this contraption. It was called scaredy cats, uh, dog treats because every dog loves a scaredy cat. And they got this old delivery van, an old UPS van, painted it the colors of the logo and had these dogs painted on the side, jumping over the driver. And they put a little kitty cat, little fluffy toy kitty cat on a fishing pole in front of the van. Didn't have an engine in it. They dragged it around to the radio stations and parked it and left it. And this is the day before internet. And, and so basically the radio guys went, what the hell is this? And they called up the number. They invited him in. He did a radio show. He brought some treats. All the people at the radio yeah. station brought their pets. Right. And suddenly they're broadcasting to thousands of people and they're doing it for an hour. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it works B2B when you're selling a, a, a mattress to one distributor or it works B2C if you're selling pet food to one radio station to then sell to a million other people. Yeah. Uh, that's the beauty of like improvising and starting with a zero budget, you know? Yeah, totally. And even and now with email and, and Twitter and all the different platforms, like it's so easy to find those individuals, both from a research side, like who am I talking to, and you know, and, and how to talk to them, where it doesn't have to cost you, uh, you know, an arm and a leg to to really get a, a good message out. There. Well, you know, it's it's funny because I I, um, I was talking to somebody who does the video content, and we were talking about with drones and stuff. Uh, and, and, and editing software and uh, audio software, this stuff costs a nickel. So it, it's getting easier than ever. If you've got an idea in your head as an entrepreneur and you go, I just want to make this, well, you can pick up, pick up the most powerful camera in the world and shoot yourself doing a silly version of it yeah. and uh, post it up on Facebook, see if a couple people like it, and then you can keep trying stuff out like that. I did that uh, on this channel here a little while ago where I decided to record radio ads that would that I'd then post to Facebook because I said, why, why does radio have to be on the radio? Huh. And so I just recorded stuff. And if you got a good script, a good script yeah. is a good script, right? That's it's good. Just, how's that working? Huh? They got, they got tons of downloads. That's great. It's that's super awesome. fun. I wouldn't uh, Yeah, that's a great idea. It's just a bizarre idea, but I think cool. it's something that's unfamiliar to the medium. You know, everybody's used to uh, you know, everybody's used to pet photography and all that kind of crap. They're not used to just a voice. Well, and now you have big brands that are, you know, are recognizing that intimacy, you know, like the latest uh, Apple uh, 11, like the one, uh, 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 Mark Andre, and uh, they get some NHL players, you know, taping. Yeah, on the stick. Phone. It's just them ha horsing around with, the, with an iPhone, and it's, it's so intimate. It's so great. It's just, it's, it's a cheaper way. 
to do stuff, you know, like people recognizing like that, you know, the, those clear channels of communication where you can, you can really hit people. Yeah. So now when you're, when, I mean, you're, you're uh, an accidental farmer, you're not in Toronto anymore. You're up North. Yes. Plowing the land like an Amish. Uh, well, <laughs> almost at times I've had my tractor stuck where, yeah, you have to do things by hand after that. But uh, no, we, we moved up here. It's just over three years ago. Uh, and that, that's impro improvisation too. Like, uh, unfortunately, um, I have two kids and our son got, uh, he got ill. Uh, he, yeah. uh, uh, was diagnosed with epilepsy four years ago and we had to get out of town we we're having too many seizures downtown and uh, concrete and uh so we, we moved up here we and we we found a school and then we moved bought a farm near the school and then uh, we've since moved schools uh, we're still trying to find our way up here so uh -huh. i'm still very much an accidental farmer but uh it, you got to be careful what you get into like you can really you know there's a lot of rabbit holes on farms like both literal and and figuratively uh, that you have to watch out for, and, and I, you know, we we didn't we didn't make out like <laughs> bandits when we left Toronto because they had changed the rules right at the time. Uh -huh. We bought the farm, so we we bought a farm, and now we had to sell our house. And then Kathleen Wynne changed the rules on buying. So for a while in the marketplace, everything slowed down, and Home Capital was on the ropes. It looks like they were going to go under uh, for a bit. So uh, everyone just took their foot off the gas of buying. But we had we just bought this farm, no conditions on financing or inspection that we were in such a hurry and we'd lost so many places up here that we just said no no you know waived all the all the conditions uh so then we had to yeah i had to hustle to find find the price of the house without selling our own um mm -hmm. i was working at anomaly at the time and i i was yeah i was getting into some really awful relations like i remember one time i, was, I had a boardroom table full of and these are the bank buyers and these are the private lenders and these are just people I don't know that well, but they seem to have money. And yeah, just like the, the nice ones were charging 17 to 22%. And then there was other people of, like, I just, I was so extended and, and then people, uh, this account woman came in she's like, this, we have a, we have a client meeting or we have a meeting in, in three minutes. I'm like, is it a client meeting? And then all these, all it was a big brand and all these, I recognized a lot of them. They all started walking in the room and I'm just like on the phone and trying to take all my, oh, I was just, it was really stressful. <laughs> so yeah, we're still trying to find our way up here, but. Yeah, oh my God. But it's, it's, I think, I think it is a case in point for everybody because I hear these stories all the time and I have a few of my own, but I think a lot of people who are DIYing their own brand are in a situation where they're like, uh Oh, I just had a cushy job and now I don't. You know, and I think it's so good to hear. Um, for example, I, I talk to a lot of people about um, uh, uh, fuck up nights, which is a thing that the tech community started because mental illness and substance abuse is rampant in that community. And we'll, because everybody apparently, except for you, goes from zero to a billion dollar IPO in three months. So you're the biggest failure ever. And these nights were started in Mexico, of all places, by tech entrepreneurs to, sit, to get people to stand up and say, you know what, I'm a big F up, just like you. And you think I've got it all together, but I don't. And I think that it's so good for people who are DIYing their own stuff to hear about crazy stuff that went sideways, experimentation, you know, finding your way with amazing constraints. And I mean, that's the story of your life. It's the story of my life. It's, uh, and, and it's sort of, it, I think it also fires up your creativity when you're under the gun, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. And it, does, it sounds like, it sounds like, you mentioned that before, like that, I'll have to check that out. Like, I love that. I love the inclusiveness of it. I love the, the permission it gives, you know, to mm -hmm. fuck up. Like that's such a, it's such a, 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 a privilege, you know, to whether it's with a brand or something, but just to get in action and, you know, maybe it's not the right thing and perfection is the, the enemy of good, but being in action is, is so much better than just like trying to, you know, mm -hmm. just a mind, mind fuck it. Well, it's also, I mean, it's the Mark Zuckerberg thing, right? God bless him. It's uh, move fast and break things. And, and I think that there's, uh, because if you've got, if you can shoot a video for no money, and put it up on Facebook and it fails utterly, well then what have you lost? You lost a bit of time and an idea, but you, at least you're a little smarter about who you're talking to and what they want to hear because you know yes. what they don't want to hear. Well, so like that, there was that Nike commercial with uh, uh, 
with Tiger Woods when he was bouncing the ball off his club and said boom, 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 and then knocks it away. That was that wasn't the scheduled shoot. Like there was a shoot and that was on a break, and then they just had the improvisation improvisational skills to turn the camera around and say, Can you do that again? And it's just something he does in his sleep, but it was never like a scripted thing. And then that became the the bigger spot, you know. Like I, I love remember. it. And and I find that even in research, that's why I love doing research, it's because people will just say stuff and you go, Oh, there you go. But it's completely different than yes. what you were expecting. And you have to be flexible enough to go, no, no, all the stuff we've been planning towards, just shelve that for now. Try this. Yes. And I think that's the beautiful thing of DIY too, because uh, you do have more liberty than if you have 500 people working in your massive company. Totally. There's a you good know? story I've told a couple of times. Is, um, ah, what was the name of the book? It was a, and it was a story of a, there was a, a guy like ourselves, a marketer. He goes down the street. He has his favorite ice cream store. And he goes in and it, at summertime, it gets really crowded. And then he, you know, trying to help them out. He goes, you know, if you set up a stand out in front of your store, you probably double your business because you, you get so many people, it's hard to get in there and you could really. So the guy tried it and he came back and he saw all these people out front. And so then he went through the outside sidewalk and it was kind of empty inside. He goes, how's it going? He goes, I'm saying I've set up this booth outside, but I'm selling the same amount of ice cream. And he goes, well, he goes, well, people are hanging around outside. We're not really, you know, not getting the flow. So he, and I would sound, and the book was about, I think, words that sell. I was the name of it. It's all about how, you know, how motivating, you know, a couple words. So he had two words, like with a compound ad, it was walk away. He called it walk away ice cream. And he had the price and the flavors. And it just put something into people's heads, that little nudge, you know. Like, you got to get out of there once you have it. Yeah, like, oh, walk away. Oh, yeah, I can actually walk and eat ice cream at the same time. You know, it's like, <laughs> I don't have to be a rocket scientist. And it, I know it sounds so idiot, you know, simple, but it was enough. People were buying outside and they were still coming in and yeah, business got better. But it's, it's amazing what a little nudge can do to somebody. I love it. I love it. Well, listen, I wanted to thank you again. Also, um, you're always freelancing. You're, you're a creative director, you're a writer, but you're always looking for uh, pieces of work. So um, one thing that I want to tell everybody on Brand DIY, I'm going to give them your, um, your email address sure. and they can, they can look you, or I'll give them your LinkedIn address and they can look you up. And if people need a mentor because you have experienced tons of stuff, especially if they're doing stuff like cross-cultural, if they're doing stuff for that, that's on, on a lean budget, uh, or they just need a, a smart guy to bounce ideas off of. I want to. I want to recommend that they come and check you out. Sure, I love. I love hearing people's stories and and where they're going with something. And yeah, if I could help them, that'd be uh, yeah, it'd be fun. Awesome, Ron McDonald, a global creative director, permanent freelancer, and improvisation specialist. Thank you so much for joining me. I'll send you some maple syrup. <laughs> Talk to you later. All right. Thank you. Bye. Man. Take care.